Okay, so we'll get started. Um, welcome to this information, information session on the health law LLM programs that are offered by Georgetown University Law Center um, through our O'Neill Institute. My name is Sarah Bosha. I'm the director of the health law programs. And during this session, we hope to give you information about the different LLMs on offer through Georgetown University Law Center, a little bit about how we support you in career development. You'll get to hear from two current students that can talk about what it feels like or what the student experience is like at Georgetown. And then finally, we'll hear from the Dean of Admissions who will share a little bit with you about the application process. Throughout that time, please feel free to use the Q&A. You don't have to wait until the end of a presentation to ask questions. You can ask your questions and my ABLE panelists will help out uh, with answering the questions. Um, I will maybe just let everybody go around and do a round of introductions from the panelists and then we can get started going through the information that we have for you. So we can start with the Dean of Admissions, Dean Boland, please go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Karen Boland. I'm Assistant Dean for Graduate Admissions and I work with all of the um, global health law applications that come here to Georgetown. So um, probably have already received applications from some of you and hope to receive more from others of you in the future. Um, and then next, my colleague and partner in crime, so to speak, Dr. Constantine, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Andres Constantin. I'm a lawyer from Argentina. I did this LLM uh, a couple of years ago and now I'm working here at Georgetown. I'm looking forward to sharing my experience and, and all the work we do to support our students uh, with you today. And then over to um, one of our students, Bailey, do you wanna go ahead? Yes, hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Bailey Smith, um, and I'm an LLM candidate in the National and Global Health Law Program. And last but certainly not least, another one of our LLM students. Alan, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Thanks, Professor Busha. My name is Alan Maleche. I'm Kenyan by birth and also taking the LLM program. I'm uh, looking forward to having a conversation with you. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll go right into the LLM program for our webinar participants. Okay, so we have two main degree programs within the health law programs. We have the LLM in national and global health law, which is 100% DC based. And then we have a joint degree, which is the LLM in global health law and governance. That particular degree consists of uh, one semester spent in Washington DC in the fall, and then another semester spent in Geneva at the Graduate Institute there um, in Switzerland. We also have certificates that students do like to take sometimes in conjunction with their main LLM studies. We have a food and drug law certificate, a US health law certificate, international human rights certificate, and a world trade organization studies certificate. Um, what, what this means is you take the main LLM uh, and then you also take the requisite courses that are always listed uh, in order for you to qualify to graduate with an LLM in national and global health law and food and drug law and a certificate in food and drug law or a certificate in US health law. The LLM in national and global health law, as I mentioned, is exclusively in DC. Um, some of the benefits or some of the, what would I say, the experience that you would have is you have the opportunity to work as a research assistant. The O'Neill itself has a number of initiatives or projects that are led by directors and a staff of researchers. Um, there's one on addiction, there's one on infectious diseases within the US, there's one on health and human rights, to name but a few. And students that apply and are admitted to the program have the opportunity to apply for paid work. So 20 hours a week where you work as a research assistant. Um, I think one of our students uh, is going to share their experience when they talk about that. In addition, you can apply for an externship while you are doing the DC program. Uh, this year, for example, we have one student who did apply for an externship to a DC-based NGO that works on global health advocacy. So those are opportunities that are available. In the past, we've also had students who have externed at the World Bank and the Food and Drug Law Institute. Um, in certain cases, your externship credits can count towards your degree completion credits. And so it's just a matter of making sure that if you pick an externship, 
the work is solely focused on global health or on health law in some way. The LLM in Global Health Law and Governance and International Governance, as I mentioned, is a joint program that we host with the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Um, this particular program is really geared towards those that are looking to explore uh, careers right at the top of global health governance and really at the seat of it, which is uh, in Geneva. Um, the spring semester that you spend in Switzerland, you will be under the instruction of Professor Jean-Luca Berkey, who is a co-author of uh, one of the leading books on global health law. He's also a former legal counsel of the WHO. He's currently involved also in the pandemic treaty uh, negotiations that are ongoing and is really a leading expert in the field. And that's one of the advantages of taking your LLM study, whether it's the Geneva program or the DC program at Georgetown Law, you're really receiving instruction from experts, from practitioners in the field, and from extremely knowledgeable people who also have the time to speak with you, to mentor you, to guide you. So you can study full-time or part-time. Uh, part-time, of course, is only open to domestic students and uh, not to international students. International students would have to uh, work full, uh, would have to, sorry, study full-time. Um, for part-time, you're looking at taking about seven credits. Once you go a little bit over that threshold, that triggers you to be a full-time student. And we do have a number that study uh, part-time here at uh, Georgetown. Um, it sees you, if you're going to do part-time, that's probably going to be about a two-year, two-calendar year, over four semesters uh, commitment in order for you to get your degree. So the, the skills that you might leave with or the knowledge you might leave with if you do one of our LLMs, you'd have knowledge in global health governance, health and human rights, food and drug law, healthcare access, particularly at, and regulation at the global and at the national level. And then of course, legal interventions on how to prevent and control infectious diseases. We are always trying to update our curriculum. I, of course I'm biased, but arguably, you know, Georgetown has the leading and most advanced and most up-to-date health law curriculum within the US and maybe really anywhere in the world. Um, so for example, the ways in which we try to update our curriculum, we look at the things that are happening, the current affairs in global health, and we figure out the skills that our students need to know in order for them to have that cutting edge when they uh, apply for jobs after they've graduated. And so one of the things we've done this year, we've introduced a course on decolonization, global health and the law. Many of you that are in the global health and health law space have seen this movement on the rise. Also issues of global health security and the law are becoming much more important and much more key, particularly as we have come out of COVID and the impact that it's had on different nations, states, and uh, the way in which trade and industry and everything is done. You know, other uh, courses that you might expect to, to study are around preventing and detecting and responding to global health threats. And then of course, LGBTQI uh, health and law, and also race and law. So the academic requirements, what does it take for you to graduate with either of these LLM degrees, whether you are a US student or an international student? So generally for the national and global health law, the requirements are for foreign trained lawyers to graduate with 20 credits. So you have about 14 specialization credits, which include the mandatory two credit survey global health law course. That two credit course just really helps you to connect with your cohort, right? To, to be able to know everybody else that you're coming in with and it creates a level playing field for everybody. We recognize that some are experts in global health, some are newly in the field, don't have those foundational uh, building blocks to really understand what it is. And so that's what the course is designed to do. And then for US trained lawyers, you are required to complete 24 credits, 16 of which must be specialization credits. Uh, for the Geneva program, uh, it's uh, 12 credits of study here in Washington, DC. And then you complete 24 specialization credits in Geneva. Uh, some of the courses you might expect to take are global health diplomacy, that's in Geneva treaty making in contemporary international society and judicial interpretation of human rights. A lot of our students, particularly those that are international are also looking to 
you know, write the New York bar when they come to US universities. And so there is that opportunity for you to take some New York bar courses within the context of the, the courses that you take for the LLM program. So while there are specialization courses, there's room for you to take courses outside of that. We also have um, academic advising where students are connected to faculty that specifically understand what it takes for foreign trained students to be able to qualify for the bar. Uh, of course, they do advise you to look on the website and do some of your own research, but that academic support does exist. What we find as well is for students that want to take the New York bar, a lot of them do tend to come on board for the summer experience so that they can start to work through some of those courses and they have a lighter load during the academic year. So this is an opportunity that is available for students that are hoping to take the New York bar. If you take either of the LLM programs, maybe if you take rather, if you take the LLM in national and global health law, that will allow you to take the New York bar. If you're gonna take the Geneva program as a foreign trained student, that will not be possible because that whole semester that you spend away, you are not able to take some of those required courses. Okay, and now I'll hand over to Andres Constantine to talk a little bit about student career development, something that we take very seriously for our students. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, exactly, as, as Sarah mentioned, we put a lot of effort and emphasis on supporting our students uh, academic, uh, academically and also in terms of their professional and career development. Uh, to that end, uh, please, next slide. To that end, we organize over, over the academic uh, year, we organize a series of events uh, like speed networking events where we have uh, different um, professionals and, and potential employers uh, from organizations come to Georgetown and then they meet with our students. Uh, here's a picture of, of those events. They meet with our students uh, over an hour and then there's kind of a reception that follows that. So it provides a, an opportunity for kind of informal networking and conversations with potential employers. We also organize a career talks and conversation series. Uh, career talks, essentially we bring professionals from different uh, areas uh, like law firms, international organizations to uh, talk about their experiences uh, working in this field with our students, and that also provides another opportunity uh, for our students to meet with them and kind of network. And conversation series, we um, launched this uh, last year. Uh, essentially, we bring experts uh, from the field uh, to talk and share their work with our students. Uh, so we have had a, a special reporter on the right to health uh, come. We had people from uh, experts in digital health and digital health law from Africa, who also share their work. Uh, an expert from Argentina, a professor who is working on empirical studies in health law. Um, so we we do a lot of uh, the, this type of academic and career development uh, events and activities. And one of the things that I would just highlight from from our program is that we provide a very tailored and personalized uh, advice. And maybe the, the students later can share a bit more about that. But we are constantly in contact with with our students, uh, I send them uh, emails every week with weekly opportunities, job opportunities that, that, that we we get from employers or alumni that uh, are, are are in touch with us and reach out with, with opportunities to share with our current students. Um, we meet with our students uh, every 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 month uh, to learn more about their career interest. Uh, uh, if something has changed on on what they want to do after graduation, and we when then we kind of plan their uh, course schedules and their activities accordingly. So just wanted to kind of highlight that and this type of events. And lastly, I just wanna mention, we uh, have a mentorship program where we match our current students with staff at the O'Neill Institute and also with graduates from our program according to their career interest. And this has been very helpful in uh, assisting our students um, in uh, their career endeavors. So that's uh, with regards to kind of professional career development. Um, is it possible to go to the next slide, please? So we, we've been talking now for, for a few minutes about the, the O'Neill Institute. Um, so just to kind of uh, clarify and share more about it, uh, the O'Neill Institute is an institute within Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, we work uh, as a research uh, think tank. Uh, we provide technical assistance to governments uh, and to our uh, local partners in different countries. We conduct academic uh, uh, law and policy research in the, in the health space. 
And uh, of course, we, we work a lot on capacity building. We have an internship program, uh, DLM programs, and um, a fellowship program. The Institute has uh, different initiatives that you, you can see here in the slide. And our LLM students are able to uh, apply to work as research assistants um, over the academic year. And so essentially, uh, if they are selected, they get to work with different one of the different initiatives at the Institute. And it's such a, a very interesting opportunity for students because they get to complement what they learn in the classroom with practical experience uh, and working uh, on different projects that has have uh, social and, 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 and uh, health impact in, in different countries. Next slide, please. So here you can see a few of uh, O'Neill uh, staff or O'Neill affiliated people. Uh, for instance, Professor Gostin, who is our uh, faculty director. Then we have the current uh, UN Special Rapporteur, uh, Dr. Tlaleng Mofokeng. He's a, she's a distinguished lecturer, and she's also going to teach the decolonization, global health and the law course with Sarah. Uh, Susan Kim, uh, she's a chief of staff, uh, staff uh, at the Department of HHS uh, here in, in the US. Regina Lavelle, she's the director of the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative at the Institute. And then we have uh, others like uh, former UN uh, reporters like Anna Grover, Daniel Spuras, and an expert, leading expert in infectious diseases, Ngozi Rondu. Okay, just now I just wanted to kind of share a bit more about uh, kind of our employment statistics and, and what happens after graduation. Usually our foreign trained lawyers and the US trained lawyers have a high post-graduation employment, roughly 80% uh, rate. And in the last three years, our alumni have been employed at the World Health Organization, the US Department of Health and Human Services, law firms, pharmaceutical companies, uh, Harvard University, Global Health Advocacy Incubator, and others. And essentially, this is a, a proof of our uh, ongoing and continuous efforts to support our the career development and, and professional careers of our students throughout the, the, the LLM program. Here you, you can see a few of our graduates and that we just kind of want to share with, with you. Uh, Kathy Schatz, she's working on kind of uh, childhood obesity and the law issues as a legal specialist with UNICEF, Ricky Meta. He was the head of US regulatory policy for Pfizer and he was very much involved in all of the discussions regarding access to vaccines over the COVID-19 pandemic. Maria, she's a senior advisor policy and government relations for Humanity United, an, an NGO here in the US. And Takuya Watanabe, he graduated with me uh, from the LM program and he's working as a compliance manager for Johnson & Johnson. Also uh, work a lot uh, and was very busy uh, as far as I know uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, now I think uh, I pass it over to you, right, Sarah? Yes. Um, so now we're going to have the students talk a little bit about their O'Neill experience. Um, I think we'll go in the same order that they introduce themselves. So we'll start with Bailey. And once Bailey's done, we'll hand over to Alan. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Well, hello again. My name is Bailey and um, I'm an LLM candidate. And I'm also pursuing the US Health Law Certificate, which I did not mention earlier. Um, just a little bit about my background. I'm US trained. So I got my JD um, from UC Hastings Law in San Francisco, California. And then I went straight into the LLM program here at Georgetown. So what led me to apply to the health law program um, at Georgetown was that during my law school experience, I was not quite sure which area of law I wanted to go into. And I tried different practice areas. I spent a lot of time doing dependency, which is foster care work um, within the US system. And I continuously saw access to healthcare issues, which ultimately propelled my very strong interest in health law. And so I realized that if I wanted to go into that space, into the health law space, I might need some more health law experience to show employers that that really is the practice area that I'm interested in. So started looking at health law programs, applying to various LLMs. And what stood out to me about Georgetown Law was just the caliber of their health law program. I was ultimately deciding between schools like Georgetown, NYU, UCLA. So those are all, you know, T14 or T20 schools, but but Georgetown's health law program just is outstanding in comparison to the other universities, just, you know, going off of what Sarah and Andy were sharing with regards to the courses, the access to faculty, um, and things like that. So in terms of career pathways I'm hoping to pursue, I'm hoping to go into um, the private 
law space, I'd like to work at a law firm just to get some really strong training and then maybe go into government work or in-house work later in my career. Um, and so in terms of just exposure to other career opportunities, having gone to law school in California, though we do speak about government work, we don't often talk about working at the federal government level. And so to be in Washington, D.C., so close to, you know, where laws are made, which is Georgetown's tagline, um, is really incredible just to be exposed to the different opportunities at the federal government level. Um, and I'll also just share some, I would say, unique benefits about studying health law at Georgetown, which would again just be the O'Neill Institute's um, faculty, the different courses, the different certificate options, and also just to be in a cohort of folks from all over the world. That's really incredible. A lot of some folks are fresh out of law school like me, some are more advanced in their careers, so we just get to learn from one another and each other's experiences, um, and we've actually I'm sure, I'm hoping Helen will agree, we've all become great friends. So I think that that's all a unique benefit of studying at the law school. Um, and then with regard to classes, there's really incredible opportunities. Last semester, I took a course um, called the O'Neill Colloquium, which Professor Gostin co-taught with another professor. And so just to be taught by a hero in the health law space, like Professor Gostin was really incredible. There were panelists of speakers who had various jobs with HHS or various nonprofits, which was just cool to hear different perspectives in the health law space. Um, and I will just end with um, echoing some of the career development opportunities that Andy was talking about. Um, it's true, he does email us once a week with different um, LLM graduates and where they're currently working. If we're interested in those organizations or firms, we can reach out to those, um, those alumni. Um, as well as job opportunities that are currently available. He sends us a list of those. In addition to that, like he said, we did have a speed networking event last semester. I think we'll also have one this semester. And so there were different um, representatives from, again, um, government, so HHS, all, other nonprofits, and just getting to getting to know folks in the health law space and create um, mentorship with, with folks already working in this space. So it's been an incredible, incredible journey, and I'm very glad that I chose to do this program. Um, is there anything else you'd like me to add, Sarah? Well, I just put up that picture for you guys having fun. <laughs> and that's just to say, guys, there is a work-study balance at Georgetown Law. And, you know, this is just to show you that in addition to the academic, there's also that fun side. So thank you so much, Bailey. Thank you. Um, Alan, over to you. Thanks. Uh, the reason why I'm not in those photos is not because I don't like work-life balance, but uh, just a coincidence, Sarah chose the ones that are not there. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. I'll speak to four areas to complement what Bailey has said, and it's indeed we are good friends. I'll talk about what I perceive as the advantages, uh, what are the pathways depending on where you are in your career, what I feel are the benefits of being at Georgetown Law University, and just end up with my own personal experience, all this hopefully in five minutes. But I'll start with the advantages, and I think the first one is networking. The networks available at Georgetown, either the O'Neill Institute, either with the university or with the broader Georgetown family, is just amazing. And the willingness of alumni to be supportive is totally beyond recognition. I think that's one key advantage. Uh, just to add to Bailey, they are seasoned professors. Uh, you get to meet people who are actually drafting treaties, a pandemic treaty, people who are working on international health regulations. So you have a sense of not only professors who are theoretical, but those who are actually on the cutting edge work of global uh, health. And I think an important thing that uh, O'Neill does is to look people into webinars and uh, speaking engagements that allow you to interact with special repertoires, people working on different work in different regions of the world. And that gives a lot of learning uh, opportunities. And I also want to say there are plenty of publishing opportunities, either on their blogs, either journal articles. So if you're people who like to write a lot, you can't miss an avenue uh, to be able to, to publish. And I, I think most importantly, the atmosphere in DC is quite right for health law and policy making. A number of key institutions sit here, PEPFA, World Bank, uh, uh, UN has a few offices, so that's a way you can easily connect with them. You have access to Congress or Senate or policymakers if issues are coming up. And the Supreme Court is located here. And one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, 
Georgetown has an arrangement with the Supreme Court lawyers where they come to practice for their cases before they go to court. So sometimes students are invited to sit in and watch the lawyers do their arguments before they actually go to the Supreme Court. So again, that can help with trial advocacy. In terms of pathway, I look at it three ways. We have colleagues who've just come straight from law school, like Bailey. Uh, there are colleagues who are midway in their careers, like me. And there are those who are very advanced. Uh, and so it depends on what you want, but you can make it work. If you're joining straight from law school, whether from Africa, whether from Latin America, whether from Asia, a pathway for fellowships exists to help groom you grow into the area. If you're a mid-level career like I am, opportunity growths are available. And if you advance, there are definitely other leadership roles outside O'Neill that Andy usually mentioned that you then be able to take forward. I think the support system is very important and I find it as a benefit. The resources academically are quite up to date, easily accessible. The library is fantastic, both online and physically. I would definitely recommend connecting with them. And then lastly, I think an important aspect is that the O'Neill Institute gives you an opportunity as an LLM and national and global health candidate to work as a research assistant. You get to make some money to be able to enjoy the social life, but you actually get a chance to practically experience what you're learning in class, whether it's on non-communicable diseases, whether it's on COVID laws. So I definitely encourage you. And I think for the application process, for those who are not US-based, I think you can also do it over email instead of having to go to the online platform, but I'm sure the people who deal with that will say, my experience was to put my papers in early, get the university to certify my transcripts, scan them, send my references, and try to have them in as early as possible. I know there are sometimes challenges with regards to funding, but I'd ask you to explore with your employers, explore with the people who give scholarships and uh, if you do get on board, the RA ship can help a bit survive uh, financially. So don't let that be a hesitation. I rather you apply and deal with the issue of I don't need, I don't know how this is going to be funded rather than hold back without being sure. So definitely worth trying, definitely worth considering. And thank you to all the colleagues who have taken time to log in and listen to this. I hope it translates to actual applications. Back to you, Professor Bosha. Thank you so much, um, Ellen and Bailey. Um, now we'll move quickly to the application process uh, and I'll hand over to Dean Voland to share with you all the details. Please, again, feel free to ask questions. You can ask in the Q&A um, and uh, I think Dean Voland will also be opening up the floor for questions as she goes through her presentation. Thank you. And yes, I've seen a couple of questions related to what are the requirements for applying both for the program and how do you apply for any scholarships that are available. So we will, we will cover all of that. Um, so I'm gonna start just generally by saying that there's no one size fits all answer for what is the ideal candidate for this program. Um, even just hearing from Alan and Bailey, they, they both came here from very different backgrounds. Um, Bailey mentioned coming directly from her first law degree. So we have both uh, students who don't have already uh, work experience in the global health field, but have developed a very clear and strong interest in the area, as well as people who have been working um, after receiving their first degree in law, and maybe they've been working specifically in the health law field, or maybe they've been working in a, a related area and have come to uh, be more interested in deepening their exposure to the, the health law side of things and making a transition. So we really have a diverse set of, of candidates in the program. The one or the one or two common factors, I would say, we're looking for people who have done well academically up to this point because it is a rigorous program. So we wanna make sure that everybody is prepared to dive in to that kind of an environment here. And we also are looking for people who have a genuine interest, uh, well, you know, well-founded basis for deciding to make this investment in uh, a program that focuses on global health law. Uh, and within the program, um, you know, as you've heard throughout the various presentations this morning, people come to it. Um, from different places, uh, people maybe within have so many opportunities to 
to explore different angles. Um, so not everyone is coming for the same reasons or taking the same kinds of classes or aiming for the same kinds of careers. Um, so there's no like one size fits all, but we do have those kind of common denominators that we are looking for in all of our applicants. For students who are applying, who have a JD degree from the United States, um, we have basically the requirements all are all the same uh, except for a few. So I'll just mention that the deadlines are slightly different for foreign train and US train, but everybody must have completed their first degree in law before uh, starting the LLM program. So if you are studying in the final year of a JD program or the final year of the law degree in your home country, the degree that makes you eligible uh, to complete, you know, becoming a lawyer in your country, then you can apply for the LLM program. We have two main deadlines to think about. We have an early action process, uh, which for fall 2023 is already passed. But basically, if you complete your application as a foreign trained student by the middle of November or as a US trained student by the beginning of January, then you receive a decision um, for foreign trained students by mid-December and for uh, US trained students by the early part of February. So it's a way to get your decision as soon as possible. Uh, it's not a binding process. So if you are admitted during that uh, time period, you don't, you're not sort of bound to attend Georgetown. Of course, we hope you will, but it gives you just a little bit more time to, to figure things out and make your plans. Aside from that, we have a regular application deadline for foreign trained students. It's February 3rd this year and for US trained students. Um, I think it is, let's see, February 10th this year. So every year they're pretty similar in terms of when they fall in the year. That later deadline, our regular action deadline is a recommended deadline. We do continue to accept and review applications that are completed after that date, but we encourage you to apply by that deadline um, because we get a lot of applications and we can't read them all in one day. So if you get it in to February, um, then you know we'll do our best to turn that around. It also gives us time to consider you for scholarship assistance. So if you don't apply until much later in the cycle, uh, it's possible that scholarship assistance won't be available at that point um, in the cycle. So what does the application consist of? There, um, I do have the, uh, no, I, I, will, I will type the, uh, the deadlines in a minute because somebody said they cannot hear very well, but I will type those uh, in the box in a little bit. Um, the application process, the very basic application form is the first place to start. And we have very detailed instructions on our website about how to go through each of the pieces of the application. Um, there are two main ways of applying. Most people apply using the system provided by the Law School Admissions Council, LSAC. Their website is lsac.org. Um, and especially if you are applying to more than one LLM program, I recommend using that service. It does cost money to create um, an account with them uh, and to have them distribute your materials to a certain number of schools, but it also enables you to just submit information one time to a central location and they will then uh, send those around to all the schools where you want to apply. The other option, if you are only applying to Georgetown or if you don't wish to pay the fees that are part of the LSAC process, is I think what Alan said that he did, you can download a paper application form from our website, you can fill it out, you can send it to us by email, and then you can send to our office directly all of the components of your application and we'll assemble them here uh, in our system. So both of those are possible. 
The components of the application, in addition to the application form and fee, our application fee is $90 for the Georgetown application. LSAC has some additional fees as well. But, in a, but the components will include um, a personal statement. This is something that probably is the most challenging piece of the application because it's where you have the most leeway to write about what you think the admissions committee would like to hear. Again, there's no one correct way to write uh, an admissions essay except for the common theme should be well written, well organized, and uh, give the admissions committee a sense of why you want to do this program and sort of how it fits into your um, your vision for your career path as a lawyer in the global health area. So um, it's usually we don't have a specific word or page limit. I would say most people write two or three pages uh, for their personal statement. So that's one piece of the application. We also ask you to please submit a copy of your resume or CV. We don't have a page limit or a format requirement for that either. We ask you to submit two letters of recommendation. Uh, the recommendations can be either from a professor from your law studies or other studies, if you wish, or for, uh, from someone that you have worked with professionally, or if there's somebody else you think can speak based on their personal experience interacting with you about your the skills and qualities that make you an excellent lawyer and or student, um, you may have that person write a letter of recommendation. For us, those are the things that we are looking for in the letter. Uh, someone who has worked closely enough with you, either as a teacher or mentor or supervisor, um, that they can really talk about the qualities that they've observed in you that will make you a good candidate for this program. If you are a non-native English speaker, then we ask you to please take a TOEFL or IELTS test. We will accept scores from either of those tests that are no more than two years old at the time that you uh, submit them. Um, sometimes people would like to request a waiver of the TOEFL if you come from a country where you perhaps have studied in English your entire life and English is kind of the official language, at least in the educational system, you can request a TOEFL waiver. Um, and then, but if you, if you are from pretty much any other country where, where even if you've studied in English some of the time, we, we do prefer to have the TOEFL or IELTS score. And it can be a, a nice thing to see a good TOEFL score in an application. So if you're able to take it, great, um, you know, go ahead and do that. TOEFL, yes, then transcripts are quite important. So we do need to receive transcripts um, from your law studies and from any other um, higher education degrees that you've received. Those can be sent either directly to LSAC if you're using the LSAC uh, platform. If you are applying using the paper application, they can be sent directly to us um, by mail or from, from the university, by the way, in a sealed envelope with you know, stamps or whatever across the, uh, the seal of the envelope. If you want to send foreign transcripts electronically, they need to come directly from some Buddy in a position of responsibility at the university. So you can't copy your own transcripts, scan your own transcripts that you might have on file and email them to us. If that's the only way that you can get it in a timely manner, we will take those, but we will need to receive official ones from the university before you matriculate. Um, we, we won't be able to accept those scanned copies. So. Um, please submit official ones. If English is not, if your transcripts are not in English, we would also need official copies of the transcripts translated into English. Um, and if you are not using LSAC and you send us the transcripts directly, you do not need to have them evaluated by any outside service. We will take a look at them 
here because we're familiar with uh, different um, methods of you know, grading and things around the world. If you apply using the paper application, you do need to um, submit the application fee. There's a way that you can do that uh, online, um, but it does, again, the $90 application fee, but you uh, don't have to pay the, the LSAC fees that if you go through that system. And let's see, the last pieces of the application, we've got the form, the transcripts, the resume, letters of recommendation, personal statement, and TOEFL. Yep, I think we've uh, hit all of them. So that's that. Are there any questions specifically about the application documents? And then I'll talk for a minute about the review process and then I'll get into um, scholarships. Um, and I can quickly um, give you the deadlines. Again, I'll type these because somebody was asking about it. So deadlines. So Karen, I also see Questions about how do you ask for a waiver, which is the TOEFL score required? Okay, yeah, you can send an email to the general admissions office address asking for a waiver and giving an explanation of why you think you need the waiver or qualify for it. So. All right, so there's the deadlines. Someone has asked about if they use a TOEFL with of 95 and take a new TOEFL before enrolling. We don't make conditional offers. Um, if we receive an application that is strong overall, but with a lower TOEFL score, there are a few different things that could happen. We could deny the applicant. We could suggest that they consider our two-year LLM program, which I can talk about in a moment. We could interview the applicant to see whether maybe the 95 TOEFL is not an accurate reflection of their English abilities. Um, but we won't um, make an offer of admission and then say, we're going to wait for you to submit at TOEFL, that's higher because we just don't have the capacity to look at applications again later after we've looked at them the first time. So any decision would be made if you want it to be made on the basis of the 95 TOEFL. Um, it may include an interview, like I said, or or some further follow up to see if how we feel about that that score. We don't right now offer um, application fee waivers based on economic hardship. We don't have a way to evaluate um, which candidates could qualify for that or not. Um, but uh, that could change in the future. But as of now, we aren't able to do that. Somebody asked. OK. I'm going to talk a little bit just so once we receive your application, once we have everything that we need, um, it will be reviewed by the, app, the admissions committee. And if you apply by the early action deadlines, as I mentioned, there's a specific date about four or six weeks after that deadline when you will receive an answer. Um, otherwise, we, we project it will take about six to 10 weeks to review your file and get thousands of applications, so it takes a long time to look at them. We are going through them as quickly as we can. Uh, if for some reason you needed a decision sooner, you can always contact our office and see if we can do it quicker. We'll do our best. We're always working as quickly as we can. Um, but that's another reason to stick with our recommended deadlines in February so that you get your answer in plenty of time to make all the preparations and visa applications and things that you would need to enroll. All right, now I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, feel free to keep putting questions um, in the chat or the Q&A, but I was gonna talk now about scholarships. So there are a number of different scholarships available for students in the Global Health Law Program and they are awarded on a rolling basis. So 
um, just the same as our admissions offers. We don't wait to receive all of the applications before we start making offers. We're doing it as we go along and the same is true with scholarships. But, and we also don't issue our scholarship decisions at the same time as the admissions decision. So some schools may write, dear Sarah, congratulations, you've been admitted to the program and here's your amount of scholarship. We don't do that, we do it uh, a few weeks or depending on the time of the year, maybe longer than that after the admissions decision. So for this year, for example, we've gotten through our early action admissions process, but we won't be starting the scholarship process for another couple of weeks. Um, so anyone on here who's already in that position of having been admitted and waiting for scholarships, um, that will still take a couple of more weeks, but we know people need that information in order to make their plans. So again, it's something that we do uh, as quickly as we can. So the types of scholarships, we have um, global health law scholars. So all admitted students to the program are considered for possibly receiving a uh, global health law scholarship. And the amounts can range from partial tuition, less than half tuition, somewhere up even to full tuition at times. And it depends on various factors, including the strength of the application, um, the number of students that we have, where we stand with our budget, um, all kinds of things like that. So the committee will take a look at applicants, will um, inform them about any scholarship award that they've received, and then the student will have some amount of time to uh, you know, decide whether they're going to accept that or not. Um, if you do take a look at our website, we have some arrangements with organizations around the world that may be available to students either who have studied it or are qualified as a lawyer in a particular country or um, things of that sort. So you're welcome to take a look at those. We do consider all admitted students automatically for um, many of those scholarships. So just as an example, I'm not gonna pick on a particular country. So if we had an, a scholarship for someone who did their law school in Antarctica, we would check to see if we've gotten any admitted students from Antarctica and uh, we would automatically consider them for that kind of funding. Um, Sarah, are there any specifics you would like to add related to scholarship funding? Um, yeah, just to say that, you know, it's good for you to write a motivation for scholarship um, in order for you to be considered. Um, really for the Global Health Law Scholars Program, we do try to do more of needs based because we want to be able to get in as many people as we can. So, you know, as, as you know, Karen said, they, they can vary. They can be as small as like a 10% or 5% tuition waiver, but right up to 100%. And I would say the 100% ones are extremely rare and extremely competitive. So it's also good for you. You can reach out to me and I can share external sources that you could also try and look for because there are a number of institutions like I know the rotaries of a lot of countries do give out funding and so if you can look for um, monies that can be available to you as a student either from a because you're from a specific region or country or because of a certain organization that operates in your country I would encourage you to do that because I do think that makes life a lot easier. That is true, yes. Uh, and even if you receive some funding from scholarships from Georgetown, you know, if you're able to supplement that with other sources that, that you find, that is always helpful. Um, I think planning financially for an LLM is very important. It's a very big investment. And in addition to the tuition, living costs are quite, you know, significant. So just keep in mind that if this is something, especially if you're someone thinking of doing it a few days, a few years from now, it's a good time to even start setting some funding aside um, for, for doing that. So, um, yes. And again, with scholarships, as I mentioned, because they are reviewed on a rolling basis uh, and because you need to have that information in order to finalize your plans, we do encourage you to apply uh, earlier rather than later and definitely by that recommended deadline. 
um, in February. So I think that's basically all I was going to talk about. I'm happy to answer any more questions. Let's see if there are any. Uh, send the link to the direct application form. So someone is asking how the university can send the transcript. So some universities may have a registrar's office or um, in the United States, a lot of universities are now using external electronic transcript services. So this, you have, as your student, you would request it from your university, but then the request would go to an external um, organization that then, you know, the, the university would have it sent to us. But if you have the official person at the school who collects and hand, you know, the person who would give you a paper copy of your transcript in an official envelope that would be sealed, hopefully that same person is able to scan it and email it directly to the law center. Uh, oh, somebody asked about the required TOEFL score. Um, we look for a minimum score of 100 on the TOEFL or 7.5 on the IELTS. And I'm typing our general email address here. So you can, um, how do we calculate the score is a question. I guess that means the TOEFL score. So the TOEFL is divided into four parts for reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Um, and generally we look for 25 in each section, but if it's a hundred or higher, it's okay if some are a little bit higher, a little bit lower. Just if we see one that's you know too low in a particular section, we might have uh, some concerns about that. Uh, Sarah, this looks like a question for you. I'd appreciate clarity regarding the difference between the curriculums. So I think maybe. Yeah, it looks like the, the, the person wants to know. I saw that question actually, and I let me, let me get it again. So, if the in South Africa, I, I believe that the LLB, you know, that's the, the main first degree in law, that should be fine. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's the first degree in law. And so we just consider basically your grades. We, um, I think Karen and her team have ways in which to assess understanding how the LLB system works you know, whether you have a 2-1 degree or a first class or a 2-2, and they can sort of assess your, your academic prowess, for lack of a better word. And so, yeah, there are ways and there are resources that do help to assess whether you would be considered someone who has, you know, academically excellent or good or fair or average. Um. The criteria for a TOEFL waiver are basically that you have studied in a country where English is the primary language. Um, so if you are from, let's say, India, for example, and maybe your native language that you grew up speaking in your home is not English, but you have studied basically throughout your studies in English, then you could request a TOEFL waiver on that basis. Um, that's just one example. And the way you do it is you just write to us and explain why you think you don't need to take the TOEFL. And we'll evaluate that. And we do need to have that decided, though, before we can review your application. And you can ask for the TOEFL waiver at the same time that you submit everything else. You can ask for it ahead of time and then submit the waiver with your application. Um, but we just need to have an answer about whether or not we need your TOEFL um, before the committee can review your file. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Karen, for- Yeah, and someone asked if they need to be admitted to the bar as a prerequisite. Uh, the answer is no. You don't need to be admitted to the bar, but you need to have completed all of the education that would be required in your country before you could become eligible to either take the bar exam if they, if they have it 
an exam in your country or be admitted to the bar um, through whatever procedures they use. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Karen. I know there's still a lot of questions, but we've sort of come to the end of our uh, webinar. So please do feel free to send, if you have any application uh, questions that are still lingering, the correct person for you to direct your email to is at the LLM admis uh, email address that uh, Karen shared in the chat. If you just generally want to know about the the program, so not application. Of course, if you if you do email me asking about the process, I'm likely to refer you to the LLM admiss address. But in any case, if you do want to know more about the program, you want to have the conversation to understand how it might be a good fit for you, feel free to email me and then we can take it from there. Um, thank you everyone for attending and uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing your applications uh, for our Health Law LLM program. Thank you. Bye, everyone.